you open in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2 is our text for this morning. Continue our study in the five solas of the Reformation with the fourth out of five. Sola gratia, saved because of grace alone. I'll read our text this morning and then we will go back and answer the question, why are we saved? Well, the answer is because of grace alone, but I promise the sermon's a little longer than that. So turn to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 1 to 10. Some good sounds in church. Kids are one of them. Pages turning are another. <laughs> Love it. Singing. Lots of good stuff. All right, let's read. This is the word of the Lord. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is God's word. Let's pray. Open our hearts, Lord, to hear your word. Lord, give us a heart that accepts it, not just joyfully for a moment, but that lets it root down deep and make its home in our heart. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Saved because of grace alone. This is a doctrine that, like we've looked at the past uh, three, that makes some people nervous. Okay, so if we really are saved by only grace, literally only grace, what, what, what happens? What does that do in a person? What, what happens if we really hold on to this doctrine as the center of the gospel? Well, Martin Luther, you've heard his name quite a bit here just because of the time frame that, that he served the Lord in during the Reformation. He was one of the catalysts of that time. He wrote a commentary on the book of Galatians. And by the way, that book of Galatians is entirely about the gospel of grace. But this is what he said. He, the, the people were concerned about this doctrine of grace alone, even in his time. He said, on the other hand, the world cannot allow those things to be condemned which it most esteems and likes the best. Therefore, it charges the gospel that it is a seditious doctrine, that it's full of errors, that it overflows commonwealths and countries and dominions and kingdoms and empires, and therefore offends both against God and the emperor. It abolishes laws, it corrupts good manners, and sets all men at liberty to do whatever they want. So with just zeal and high service to God, as it would seem to them, it persecutes this doctrine and abhors the teacher and the professor of it as the greatest plague that can be in the whole earth. This is what some people in Martin Luther's day think about the doctrine of grace. You let this sucker free, it's going to just ruin everything. People will have bad, ma their bad manners, they'll just do whatever they want, because why? Well, they're forgiven by grace. Well, is this really the gospel of grace? Is this the truth about what grace does in the church? Is it the greatest plague that's ever swept across the planet, or is it the best news that you'll ever hear? The, the, the question that we're trying to answer is, why 
are we saved. We saw last week how we are saved, the means of our salvation, and that's by grace alone. But now we look today at the question, why are we saved? On what basis can we say, I am truly saved in Christ? We see, first of all, that it is because of God, because of God that we are saved. And it must be because of Him, and only because of Him, because of our condition of sin. Look back at chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. These are some, some, some bad verses. If you're having a bad day and, and you, you use your Bible reading to kind of perk yourself up, I wouldn't recommend going to verses 1 through 3. Now, it's, it's, it's stuff that we need, and we need to hear it, and God knows that why it's here. But what does it tell us about ourselves? It tells us we have a condition, and our condition is sin through and through. He says, verse 1, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Right? Now, this is not just us. We, we look around at the world around us, and we see deadness and sin, but what verses 1 through 3 tell us is that what we see in the world in general is true of me and you specifically. We I was dead in sin, dead in trespasses and sins. These two words are not like different levels of iniquity before God, but, but rather they, they emphasize that, that the equality of humans that we have before lo the Lord is that we are made in His image, first and foremost, but then we are dead in sin. We have that all in common together. It's, it's the doctrine of total depravity, or, or better maybe even total inability there's not one person on the planet that has anything in us that can come to God and be commended for salvation. It's got to be totally of Him because not anything in us, we are as corrupt as we could be. Now, there's, there's not, it's not true that we're all as evil as we could be, right? There are some people that are far more wicked than others. But it is true that we are corrupted to the core, that every part of our being, our emotions, our mind, our will, every part of us is infected with sin. None is righteous, we read last week. No, not one. This means that a, a sweet old granny and a murderer are equally excluded from the kingdom of God apart from Christ. The reason because, that this is is because in the garden there was one outcome for humanity that they should, if they should choose to sin. What was it? In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die, right? Death. You were dead in your trespasses. We are dead, spiritually incapacitated, spiritually decapitated, with no ability to do anything that would lead us to spiritual life. A dead person cannot even raise himself. Even Jesus, we, we see in chapter 1, if you just put your eyes there for a minute, in verses 19 and 20, Jesus himself is raised by the immeasurable greatness of his power, God's power, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Right, friends, left in our spiritually dead state, we are designated, the text tells us, children of wrath like the rest of mankind. We have nothing that we can bring. We are completely and totally laying on the floor with no ability to get up again. This is one of the most foundational truths, friends, of the Christian worldview. And it teaches us very plainly that we, all humanity, are dead in trespasses and sins. But just notice the difference, why this is such an important doctrine, okay? If, if, if people are, at the core, truly good, Okay? If people are really good people, then the solution for all the problems that we see in the world are going to be found out there, not in here. Right? If people are truly good, then what the issue is, is the circumstances around the people. Right? That's why evil things happen. Not because people are really evil, but because systems are evil. But because societies are evil. Because of institutions are evil, because that person is, is oppressed in poverty, or because that person is even of, of a certain color of skin or another color of skin. If people are at base good, then our problem lies out there. But think of it this way, if people are at base sinful, then where does the problem lie? Right? It's within us. 
right? We, we, we have sinful people. It's, a, it's a, a sinful desire. It's a heart that wants selfishness. It's, it's, it's motives that refuse to bow the knee to Christ. It's, it's not honoring Him as God, but rather placing ourselves above Him in all things. That's the, the root of all of our problems. That's, that's being dead in sin. The problem is with us. You know, it's, it's good that the Lord gives us different seasons and different things that happen. And, and I'd say even election season is one of those good things from the Lord because what we see playing out in front of our eyes is where our hope lies. Who are you trusting in? As you went to the polls, what were you hoping would happen? What were you ultimately thinking would make a change in the country, in the land that we live in? Let me ask you the question, is it enough to have Republicans in office without repentance in the nation? Is it enough? Is it sufficient for us to to, to legislate social equality across the board without submitting to God's order in the world? Where's your hope, Christian? Are you trusting in princes that finally, if we get that person in, then things will turn around? The Bible says don't put your trust in princes because even if things turn around for a few years, what happens? Well, he gets ousted and things go back. Why? Because humans are at base sinful. And left to our own, we will every single time mess it up. We will every single time bring unrighteousness to bear in the world. Without the prince of peace reigning and ruling in the hearts of man, we have no hope. But praise God, we can have hope because, because we're told that the Bible, in, in the Bible that the Lord sets up kings and he tears down kings. We're, we're told of instances where God takes the heart of a king and he, he winds it like a river, right? We're told of even wicked kings of Persia, right, that, that all of a sudden have this change of heart and want to honor God with their rulings. God can make a change. God can make a difference, but it's God that does it. It's not us, it's not anything that we can do, but it's all God. We are saved because of grace and because of God. But so so then how can we expect? Let's say we, we, we do have, we realize, okay, people are at base sinful. How can we expect men and women who are corrupt to the very core to make a change in repentance? How is it that a spiritually dead person with no spiritual ability, can do anything that would lead to spiritual good? The answer is because of God, but specifically because of God's condition of love. Look at verse 4. Our condition is sin, but God. Those are two of the greatest words in Scripture sometimes. But God. Right? This is who we were, but God. Right? There's, there's a change that's happening. Because dead humans can't do anything, the adverse must be true. God has to be the one to act. But why would he do that? Can, if verses 1 through 3 are true about the world, why would God ever want to do anything for, 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 for children of wrath? The answer is because he is rich in mercy. Because he is rich in mercy. Because he has great love. Right? The, 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 the reason that this trajectory turns is purely and exclusively because of something in his nature, his condition that is not our own. He is rich in mercy, the text tells us. The, the, the cause behind God saving sinners is something that he has. It's mercy. Right? Being rich is some, it means that you have more than enough for the need. So God, when he acts toward us in mercy, he is not sparing. He is not stingy. He gives us more than we need of mercy in our life. Right? Mercy looks at what is deserved and then doesn't give it. What do children of wrath deserve? Wrath. So if you don't receive God's wrath, what's true? God is rich in mercy. He's good. It's his mercy, but it's also, look, his love, it says. Because of the great love with which he loved us. Now, you can no doubt in your mind picture a scene 
I like, I like courtroom movies and shows and stuff. I don't know. It's just something. But especially historical courtroom scenes, okay? Like, so I, I have in my mind's eye of this, this, you know, courtroom in England somewhere, like back in the 1700s, and you got this guy sitting up on the bench in big, long red robes and the curly white wig sitting there. And, and then, then you have this lawyer that comes up, and the, the, the decision has been made that his client is guilty. No doubt about it. And so the, the judge is about ready to pass a sentence and the lawyer goes before the judge and pleads for mercy on the, the sa- for the sake of his client. And, and I, can, I can picture in my mind's eye this judge just sort of coldly, unfeelingly passing a sentence that is maybe a little less than the maximum in mercy. And he says, in mercy I will give you five years or whatever. Friends, what we have in God is not an unfeeling, cold, giving out of what we don't, or, or, or with, rather withholding what we deserve. What we have in God is more of like the picture from Luke 15 of a loving father opening his arms wide and embracing a son who is by, no, uh, by all accounts guilty. And yet, he's tearfully accepting him back into the family. Friends, you have no need to fear going to God and asking for mercy that you'll be turned away. You have no need to fear that what you do, what, what happens when you go before him is that you'll get a good talking to and you'll, you'll, you'll get beat down a little bit and then, and then be given mercy. God acts toward us in grace because of the great love with which he loved us. He is a kind father. He is not withholding mercy for his he is not being stingy with his mercy but he is lavishing on it on us in christ praise his name that we have the riches of mercy in christ that god acted on our behalf so why are we saved right this the answer is god god all the way through and this this has to change the way that some of us talk about our testimony Right? Our testimony is, is a story about what God did in our lives. Some of us begin our testimony with, I sought after God and I finally found him. Well, that may be true and it probably is true that you, that you searched. But what was happening on the backside of that? John 6.44 says this, that, that Jesus says that those whom the Father draws to the Son... I'm sorry, no one can come to, the, to, to, to Jesus unless the Father who sent me draws him. Right? You and I don't seek God after our own, but he draws us to himself. But what does the text tell us right after that? Jesus says, I will raise him up on the last day. The reason, friends, that we are brought to grace and the reason that we are kept in grace is because of God and not ourselves. And so, therefore, our testimony should have all kinds of phrases like, God did this and God did this brought me here, and God showed me this, and God gave me this. I was a sinner. I, it was like we sang, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling, but God. So we are saved because of God, and then secondly, we are saved because of grace. Because of grace, it's already been plain that whatever God does in our direction, other than wrath, is by, ne- by definition grace. Because wrath is the only thing that fallen humanity deserves. But this text gives us so much more. It, it delves into what that grace is so that we, as we sit here today, those of us who are in Christ, we raise our gaze a little bit higher and we look to God who pours out his riches and grace on us to see what it is that he really has done in bringing us to salvation. First look that we are united with Christ. Verse 5, even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. Right? What we could not do on our own, God did for us. He made us alive. That, that, the, the phrase there is really a translation of a single Greek word that begins with a synonym, S, or a, a prefix, S-Y-N. It's like synonym, right? Being with other words, right? Some words are together with other words, right? You, you have things like people will say synergy, where you've got multiple people adding their energy, like, I don't know, say to cut a bunch of wood, right? Heading in the same direction, right? You're, you're together with somebody else. What this tells us is that we are made alive not because 
all of a sudden we just got some energy up or not because all of a sudden we just got real spiritual one Sunday, but we are made alive together with Christ. Our, our spiritual resurrection from, from the dead to life happened only because we were placed in him. We were united to him. And how were we united to him? We saw last week, right, through faith through acknowledging, believing what God said is true, that, that he, really did, uh, he really did sacrifice himself on the cross on our behalf and raised him up from the grave. Right, this is by grace you have been saved. He says, by grace you have been saved. There's no way for us, no way for us to think that any part of us, a, a dead corpse spiritually, could do anything to deserve to be being raised with Christ, it's because of grace. Grace is this umbrella description of all that we receive in him. Verse 6, what else happens to us? We're given new life in Christ, and we are given new position in Christ. New position in Christ. He raised us up with him, and he seated us with him in the heavenly places. I mean, glory of glories. What happened to us in Christ? Right? Well, to understand that, we have to ask the question, where is Jesus now? If we've been seated with him in the heavenly places, we know where he's at. Right? He is at the right hand of the Father. Right? What, Jesus, what happened was Jesus, the eternal Christ, took on flesh. We're about ready to prepare our hearts to celebrate that again. How the, the eternal second person of the Godhead came down in flesh walked around on the earth for 33 years before being crucified and buried, and then on the third day was physically resurrected from the dead. And then after that, he walked around on the earth for 40 days before ascending to the right hand of the Father. And what, what Peter says in his sermon at Pentecost, he, he quotes Psalm 110. This was the prophecy from long ago. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Where is Christ? He's seated at the right hand of the Father in a place of honor, in a place of glory, in a place of victory over all powers and authorities. That's where Jesus is. So just sit back in a moment and think about this incredible glory that you and I have in Jesus. If that's where he is and we are seated with him, then where are we? Believer, where are, where's our new position in Christ? Is it not with Christ at the right hand of the Father? Do we not in Christ then receive all the riches that are His? If we are seated with Him, then all that, it is, all that is Christ's is ours. Is there any question that this is by grace? That everything that we are given is because, only because, we have received it in Christ. What a grace we have found in him. Friends, all, all the power that you and I need to conquer sin is found in Jesus, sitting at the right hand of the Father. All the authority that we need to call sinners in the world to repent is found in Jesus, sitting at the right hand of the Father. All the, the status and position that we need to walk in victory in our life here and now is found in in Jesus, seated at the right hand of the Father. We are in Him. We are seated with Him. We have all things in Christ. It's just a great thing to dwell on. If you ever have doubts about how you, where you stand with Christ, about where you're at with, with God, if you are in Christ, believer, run to this passage. Flee to these words and remind yourself that in him you have everything that you need in Jesus. Verse 7 then, as a result of this new life and new position, we are given new purpose in Christ. What does verse 7 say? So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. What's your life to look like now that you're in Christ? What, what is daily Monday? Like, what does Monday look like? 
For instance, if you are in Jesus, if you are seated with him at the right hand of the Father, how does that change your Monday morning? Well, we're told what happens when we are in Christ is that we become the stage of his grace to the rest of the world. What God does in us in saving us by grace alone is that we become the display of of all that God wants to do in the world. We, we become the display of his divine mercy to the world, right? We live our testimony in front of people, showing what it is to walk in union with Christ. We, we show the world what it is to, to walk not under the power of sin, but instead by the Spirit. We, we become the, the performance of all the riches of grace that are in Jesus, What are these riches that he talks about? The riches of grace and kindness. Look back with me at at chapter 1. We're going to gaze at some riches here. Verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. Glory be to the Father. We have redemption through his blood. What riches we have. We have the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Praise be to God that we have riches in Christ. Right? We are, we are, we have la- which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and on earth. Verse 11, in him, what else do we have? We have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. What riches we have in Christ, believer. Verse 13, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glorious grace. Look at all the riches that we have in Jesus. Forgiveness of our sins. New position in Christ. New power to live according to the Spirit. Verse 18. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Notice whose inheritance this is. What's your purpose, Christian, in life? It is to become a treasured possession for God. What God is doing in us is he is purifying us. He is making us like himself in order to present us to him in the coming ages, a pure and blameless bride. He is is saving for himself an inheritance. We live to the praise of his glory. That's the riches of his grace in us. That is our purpose in Christ is to spend every breath that we have to praise him. And friends, we will never run out of reasons to praise. We have immeasurable riches to turn around and give to God back in praise. This is our purpose in Christ. And notice something, that we cannot claim the credit for any of this. Verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. The grace of God in all that we have just seen is only, that's our only basis. That's the only reason that we experience any of it. Why are we saved? It's because of God's grace. But as we saw last week, we remember we we believe God. We believe when he says that he will unite us to him in faith. But it's not because of our faith that we are saved. It is because of his grace that we are saved. It's because he has acted on our behalf. He has pulled us up out of the mire. He he, he emphasizes this. He says, this is not your own doing, verse 8. Some of us in our pride, we just just cling to the, 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 the desire to have something, something to do with our salvation. We just we just long to say that we had some part in us coming to Christ. That, yeah, God did the majority of the work, but I just, this one little thing, I just did this at least. Right? I, I, yes, God lavished his grace upon us, but, but, but I, I exercised some faith at least, right? We want to say there's something that I did, but, 
but the text tells us this is not your own doing. Right? So even our exercise of faith in verse 8 is not something that we can claim credit for. It's fully from him. There's a great picture of what this looks like in the Old Testament. One of my favorite uh, passages that answers the question, how is it that dead people are brought to life? It's from Ezekiel 37. And I'm just going to read the text here. It stands on its own. It says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me up out of the, in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, they were very many on the, fir- the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. Okay, these are dead, dry bones. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and you will cause, and, and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. And so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound. And behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them. And flesh had come upon them. And skin had covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves, and will raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel. You shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from my graves, or your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. How are dead people brought to life? Because God. Because God raises us to life. It is nothing in us. We cannot claim a bit of it. But we're told it is the gift of God. A gift is not earned. A gift is not given exchange for some work that we've done. But a gift is full of riches, given without strings attached, and tied up with a bow of his beauty in the gospel of grace. It's a gift of God. And the result of this is that no one may boast. If this is true, the text tells us that, that, that no one can come before God and say, even in the smallest sense, look what I did. No, it's all, look what God did. Look at my life. Look at who I was. This is the, the, the I love listening to testimonies of how God's grace, I hope you do too, of how God's grace has worked in people's life. And I love the part of the testimony when when the person has been describing what their life looked like before Christ and and its darkness and its its despair, its hopelessness. And then there's a moment in the testimony where they say something like, but then God. And I mean, I tell you, it's like, that's tears flooding for me, man. I don't know about you, but that's like, the, the faucet is opened at that moment because there is something beautiful in somebody saying, I, I had nothing. I, 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 I could do nothing. You look at who I was and there was nothing that would, that would even make you think that I would be the person that I am today. And why did all that happen? Because God. It's not my boasting. It's not your boasting. But it's that we praise his name in all things. But why is this such a dangerous doctrine? <laughs> why, why do some people really balk at the idea of salvation by grace alone? Well, isn't it because if humans are left free to sin because we're saved by grace, 
If, if humans take hold of this doctrine that I am saved not because of what I do, good or bad, but because of what God has done, then doesn't that mean that it doesn't matter what I do? That my salvation is secure in God? Right? This is why that, that, that phrase, that doctrine that we, we say once saved, always saved, you've got to be careful of the context you hear that in. Because if people use that phrase to say, therefore, that person that lived totally apart from Christ their entire life is safe with God, it, it, there, there's a big question mark there. Are we allowed to do that? Is that what grace does in the heart of a believer? Does it save us so that then we get to go do whatever we want and we're safe in Him? The answer is, from, from Paul's words, is by no means. Romans 6.1, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? And then Colossians 3, 1 through 4, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are here on earth. Why? For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We, we, we don't get saved by grace and then live apart from Christ. Our life is with Him. We're seated at the right hand of the Father. So then we seek those things. We seek to live according to that life. And this is in our text, our last point that we, we look at. Why are we saved? We saw in the basis that we are saved. It's because of God's grace. But now we see the purpose for which we are saved. And the, the answer is for good works. Why, why are you saved, Christian? Verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Notice verse 10, we are a new creation. When we are brought to life in Christ, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. This is the answer to the question, why is it that our faith, our, our salvation is not because of works? It's because we didn't work, he worked in us. Right, we are in no way self-made individuals. You know that term, don't you? Self-made, like he's a self-made man. You'll, you'll, you'll say that about people who are successful in business, right? He, he, there, there, there's nothing. He doesn't owe anything else to anybody else, right? He is who he is today because of what he did, right? He pulled himself up from his bootstraps, right? He put in the hard work, and now he's reaping the benefits of what he did, right? He's a self-made man. Friends, before the cross, there are no self-made men or women. Not one of us has anything to claim in him. Right? We are created in Christ Jesus. We are a new creation. Right? This is uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. Behold, the new has come. And as new creatures, we are told that we get a new purpose. We're created with a new, pers uh, a new purpose. Why, were, why are we created in Christ? For good works. Right? We, we totally rely on being made alive in Christ in order to do things for Christ. Our good works are found only in Him. We're told that God prepared them beforehand that we should walk in them. It, I don't know if you like antique shopping, right? but when you're walking through a place like Coppas Commons and you're looking at all the cool like, furniture and stuff, not one person, I don't think, comes along and looks at an old antique desk that is just beautiful like maybe like I don't know is it tiger maple is that like cool little waves in there not one person comes along and praises the wood do they right I, I, I hesitate to even bring this up again but not one person looks at a, a, a beautiful ham sandwich sitting on the counter and praises the ham <laughs> right we, we don't sit down at a meal in a restaurant and and just think man that is that is some great roast beef Right? What do we do? We turn and we praise the one who made it. Don't we? We say, wow, what, what craftsmanship. Wow, what artistry. Wow, what, what, what beauty. What, what great work happened here. So, so what happens with us? When, when, when people come along for us, or like what Jesus said, that, that we let our, our, our light shine among others so that they may look at our good works and glorify God. 
what happens is they see in us that God has done something. He has, he has changed something. He has made something come about that otherwise wouldn't be there. And the purpose is not so that you and I can say, yeah, you're right, I got a lot of good works. Like, hey, did I show you my attendance record for church? Like, this is, I've been there straight for 57 years, right? Never missed a Sunday, right? Like, it's not for that. It's glory to God that I got to worship around his throne for 57 years straight. That he brought me, he gave me the health I needed. He brought me there every Sunday, right? Our lives become the stage in which his glory is played out through our good works, so it is not that we work in order to be saved. It is, work, it, it is that we work because we are saved. Because in him we have everything that we need to live a godly life. Because in him we have been given new life in Christ and now we seek those things that are above. We don't claim our good works at the throne. We claim Christ. We say it's because of him that I, that I showed up here, not because of me. But then while we are here, we've got a job to do. We've got purpose in life. We glorify him with our lives. I want to close this morning with reading out of Titus chapter 2. And, and this is going to serve as sort of an invitation to, to all of us. But the invitation is different depending on how you come this morning. Do you come in Christ this morning? Believer, are you here because Christ has saved you? Are you here because you are in Christ and you just can't, be away from him. You've got to gather together with the body. You've got to come and give him praise. If that's the case, then this is an invitation to see all the things that you have in Jesus and to turn and give him more praise, to give him more thanksgiving. But if you're here this morning and you are not found in Christ, you, you've been trusting in, in, in coming to church to get you all cleaned up so that God would accept you. If you're here because you, you, you know that that, that you got to do something, that, that you know, to be a good person, i gotta, I got to make it look like I'm good, a good person. i got to clean up the street front so that way maybe the inside would get changed. If you find out this morning because of God's word that you've been trusting in the totally wrong thing, that only God can save you, then this text serves as an invitation to you to lay your life down before him saying, Lord, I am only dead. I'm only dead apart from you. I am only a child of wrath. And it's because of your grace that I'm made alive. And if that's, that's what is going on in your heart and in your mind this morning, then, then I'd, I'd love to talk with you and we can talk more about this. But you, you, the, the Bible says to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. Praise God. I'm going to read this, this text from Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would create in us a people who are zealous for good works, not so that we might become saved, but so that we might display the riches of your glorious inheritance in us, your saints, to the praise of your glorious grace. And it's in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen.